Well, good morning, some of you family. How are we? Good, good. Thank you guys for braving the cold to be here in person. And for those who are online with us on our online campus, welcome. Thank you for committing to this moment uh, to grow together, to learn together, and just be a part of the family of God together. Uh, if you and, and I have not had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Kenan. I'm one of the pastors here at Summit View, and I actually work with Pastor David Libby on the West Side campus. I get the joy and the privilege and the honor to be the community pastor over there, which means I oversee an array of different things. Every week is a new challenge, and it's just, it's just fun. I really, really, really enjoy it. Uh, my, my wife and I, uh, Carissa, we've been married uh, nine years, been together for 14. Mm-hmm. 14 years. And we have three beautiful children together. Our oldest, Jeremiah, is about to turn eight in a few weeks. Our middle guy, Hudson, just turned six. It was his birthday this last weekend. And then we have our little baby girl, uh, Eliana. I call her my Ellie Bean. Um, and she's one active little almost four-year-old. She's so precious. But uh, I don't know about you, but during this whole quarantine and COVID season, I love them dearly. They're gonna probably watch this later at some point in their lives. I love you. But I don't know if they've ever driven me more crazy. Anybody with me? I mean, amen. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll just be that parent. I'll admit Admit my sin in front of the rest of us. Um, they, you know, I love my kids so much. Uh, let me uh, let me pray for us before I do so. If you got your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter four. Uh, we are going to be marking a transition in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, where uh, he he has done a really good job of building a lot of orthodoxy, right? A lot of theology, a lot of this is what we believe and this is why. And, and now we're going to actually turn the page, if you will. There's going to be a pivot point in his letter where we're going to talk about orthopraxy. Well, we're going to talk about how do we work out this theology. And I believe that everything in this letter is kind of culminating into this moment. I believe it's true for this letter, but also for our cultural moment. So let me pray. And we're gonna dive into what God has got for us uh, this morning. God, we thank you that you are a God who is both lovely and loves us. Thank you for your community. You, we call the church. God, thank you that you are the head, that you are in charge, that you are sovereign. Father, help us to be in this moment together, both in person and as we gather online. Father, may from today and the weeks, months, years to follow, whenever we're engaging with this, may, may you speak to us in this moment. God, and may you unify and bind us together as your church. We pray these things and all God's people said, amen. Now, I am a 90s kid. I grew up in the 90s and I was and I was in early 90s. I wasn't like some of these, you know, 1998ers. No, no, no. I was a 91er. Don't do the math cuz then you're going to be like, "Whoa, don't do it." 91 and I remember growing up and see here's the thing about being a 90s kid. We were on the cutting edge of the technological advances of our time. Now, I never experienced laser discs, but I had a Walkman Bass boost and the whole nine. You can only listen to that Walkman for like 2 minutes one song with bass boost engaged. Oh, I remember. I absolutely remember. And I really remember the transition from VHS to DVD to Blu-ray. And what is it now? We're like, we're streaming in like 8K on like 75 inch screens that hang on our wall that are this. I mean, what is happening? The, techno I mean, the technology we have today is insane. But I don't know about you, but I remember good old Blockbuster Video. Anybody with me? Okay, now, how many of you, how many of you went to Blockbuster Video Okay, how many of you, and especially as those of you who are online with us, I want you to actually type in, let me know, because I mean, we need a tally here, all right? This is not to divide us, this is just so we know who to pray for. So, the Blockbuster video again, they see him, okay? All right, and then how many of you frequented Hollywood video? Oh, we got a couple, about the same ratio as the first service, this is so good. Um, so for those who frequented Hollywood video, we'll pray for you um, as you continue to flesh out sanctification. No, we, there was a Blockbuster Literally around the corner from my house, my brother and I, we would walk to Blockbuster Video. And if you were lucky enough, if the, if the movie was new enough, you would actually get the box that had the cover, right? Like the actual movie cover. Because otherwise it came in like this weird white box with just the printed name of whatever it was. And you're like, oh, cool. I got one of those. Great. And then as you would grab it, you always had to have a parent around to open this box, did you not? Do you guys remember opening up those boxes where it's like, you'd sit there as a kid and you're, you can't do it, you gotta hand it off. So what we would do is we would prep, right? We would prep and go, okay, mom, dad, you got the box. 
Brother and I, we're gonna get popcorn, we got all the treats, we got all the goodies, we're gonna sit and we're gonna be prepared for this moment. And his dad usually, because he was the only one strong enough or he had the vice grip in the garage that he could pry this thing open with, that he would get it ready and there was always that collective moment, right? Everyone started to breathe a little bit heavier. It was, okay, let's open the box. Do you know what I'm talking about? Right, when you'd open this VHS, and of course, and his dad would pry it open, the VHS would fly through the air. This was an Olympic sport all in itself, was it not? Who could actually catch the VHS midair? So you did, you caught it, and you're like, that's right, gold medal. Then, as you would go to put it in, there was this moment, because you would look and see which side of the reel the film was on. How many are with me, right, how many are with me? Now, if it was on the left side, you're like, Thank you, Jesus. There's a God above. He loves, he shines upon me. Oh, this is... But if your VHS tape looked like this, oh, it's about to go. Okay, who wasn't? And like I said, online campus, please let me know in the comments who was not ready to literally hire a private investigator, find out who these people are, and absolutely prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Like, you were gonna go after them, you were gonna go after them hard. If you didn't rewind, okay, who remembers the saying? Be kind and rewind. There was literally a saying around it because culturally it bound us together. If you didn't do this, you were on the no-fly list. You didn't go anywhere until you had paid your debt of injustice to humanity. These, these, these interesting things that, that bound us together as people. These unsaid rules, these, these pieces were like, yeah, this is what we do. This is who we are. And I remember being in the fifth grade and waking up and actually seeing planes flying into the Twin Towers. And I saw a very real moment of desperate moment of unity that we experienced as a country. I remember that moment like it was yesterday, walking out of my bedroom and seeing that. And I, what I saw is I saw us as an American people, we bound together like nothing before. Why? Because it was a desperate moment. Friends, we're in a desperate moment for unity yet again. And if you are not a Christ follower in this room, we're so glad that you're here. If you are not a Christ follower walking with Jesus, we're so glad that you've stepped into this moment. But I'm, what I'm gonna do is this is actually gonna be a bit of a family discussion. So if you're not following Jesus, this is kind of a moment where you get to look in at the family of God and go, okay, how would it look like if I joined and be, was a part of this? How do they do things as a part of the church? That's what this morning is gonna be. So I wanna invite you to hang in there and just sit back and relax and maybe have that ear of what would this be like? Because family, we need to have a family discussion. Because we are in a desperate moment for unity. And in fact, unity, as it's defined, is not even sameness, right? Unity is not uniformity. It doesn't mean that if you're a follower of Christ, we all look the same, we all act, that's not, that's not what that means. But in fact, unity is oneness of purpose. So if you are a member of the family of God, we are one with purpose. And this morning we are gonna dive into what Paul would have us do. Paul would say about unity, starting in verse one, where he says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, everyone say urge. Urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager, everybody say eager. Eager. eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Because see, what we've just gone through is we've gone through the last three chapters where again, Paul is going over the orthodoxy, the theology of what are we now? What are we now? Now that we're in Christ, what are we? Well, we are now heirs with Christ. We're adopted, we are justified, we're reconciled to both God and man because of the work of Jesus. This is who we are now. 
So now the question needs to be, how then do we live out of that? Now that this is our reality, how do we live this out? What does this actually look like? Well, my friends, I wanna be honest with you. People will know whose we are by what we do, not by what we know. We can know a lot of stuff. But people are gonna know whose we are, what banner falls behind us by what we do, not by what we know. So what is it that we do? In fact, Paul talks about this a little bit. In fact, Paul lines it up in such a way you could look at it as kingdom values versus the values of the world. See, in the kingdom, you have things like humility. You have things like gentleness and patience. We bear with one another. Right, these are not things like don't cuss, don't drink, don't see wrong movies. Like These are not expressions out there. These are inner character and they work themselves out. Right, this is who you are. This is who we are. And I'm gonna be honest with you, friends. Some of these, especially this top one, I'm gonna be real with you. This one's tough for me because the world tells me and my flesh tells me that it's about me, that I, I live the way that I wanna live. That if something's uncomfortable for me, that I can go ahead and change it because I need to be comfortable. It doesn't matter who it affects. So this one is definitely harder for me, absolutely. But what is one of the biggest kingdom values on it? These are all super important, but we get down to here. And right now in our cultural moment, this one right here, unity, is in direct, direct opposition to where we find ourselves in the world. Is the world not right now breeding division after division after division? It becomes a conversation of us versus them all the time. And this is why we must stand in opposition to this. Right? We, we maintain this unity. We are eager to maintain this unity. We are eager to hold these kingdom values. Why? Because it is the spirit that binds us all together. The spirit is who's empowering us to do this. So my friends, I have to have a moment with us this morning. If we find ourselves having a challenge to say, well, these, these kingdom values that we, that we talk about, these kingdom values that we have, these are actually really, really, really hard for me. That, that doesn't define my life. Real moment? That's probably because we are not walking in the spirit as closely as we should. We're not maintaining the unity within the spirit because if we were, these things would be the natural outworking of the spirit of God. And this is why we must be eager, eager to maintain this unity because Paul continues in verse four where he says, you know, especially those on the online campus, I need you to do something specifically for me. I need you to remember and write down in the comments how many times the word one comes up. Because there's a few of them. So pay attention. All those who are one says this, there is one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Friends, we are one because God is one. That is why we maintain it, because God is one. We now fall under Christ. Because of the spirit, we are now one because he's one. So that's why we have to fight to maintain this. We are his ambassadors. We are those in which he wants to partner with. I love that God is the great delegator, that he actually wants to work and move in and through humanity. And in so doing, he says, look, just as I am one, you are to be one. And friends, when we don't do this, when we live in opposition to unity, we breed division worse than anybody else because the enemy is looking for the church to divide the church, to go after the church. As the bride of Christ, this is where he wants to dig his claws in and absolutely shred us apart. 
but see, we're called to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling. This is what we are called to do. And I like to say this, that we're actually called to be truly human because see, when we act like the world, there's almost like this beast nature that comes out in us. And so to truly be human, we live life through the spirit of God. This means glorifying God in everything that we do. One of the biggest purposes of man is to glorify God in everything that we do. Why? Because we bear his image. We, we don't bear our own image. We bear his image. We carry that image wherever we go. This is something we get to take on and take off. As a human being, we bear his image. Pastor Tim Keller, in his book, Jesus the King, he says this. He says, you're glorifying something when you find it beautiful for what it is in and of itself. Now he's talking about both God here and also how do we interact with each other? This is a unity conversation within the body. It's beauty compels you to adore it, to have your imagination captured by it. He then goes on to say this. He says, when you say I'll serve as long as I'm getting benefits from it, guilty, that's not actually serving people. Right? How many of you actually step into a, a moment with somebody and or you're doing that calculation in your head where you're like, okay, what am I gonna get out of this? Is this gonna cost me too much? Is this worth my time? Is this worth getting into? And we begin to look at this at, through a lens of serving ourselves. It's serving ourselves through them. It's not circling them, orbiting around them. It's what? It's using them, getting them to orbit around you. Friends, we do this all the time with God and we do this all the time with each other. We need to be marked, marked by people who fight for each other, not with each other. That needs to mark us as a people. Like the world around us knows that, oh no, these people don't fight with each other. They fight for each other. And we need to give a lot more intellectual equity, thinking through how are we going to build each other up in Christ for the sake of each other. We need to do this a lot more. In fact, I would even argue this. I would say this, when one of us wins, we all win. But even more so to contrast that, to contrast that is this to say, when one of us loses, we all lose. How often do we think of it that way? Usually it's like a hurrah, like, oh, hey, if they win, we're winning, that's great, because that feels good. But what happens when someone is losing? What happens when someone is hurting? What happens when someone is going through something that we don't, are not going on our own? Is it easier for us just to step away? It's like, I don't wanna deal with that. I don't wanna step into that. I don't wanna be a part of that pain. When we lose, we all lose. When we suffer, we all suffer. My hope would that we be so tightly knit together that when someone's going through something, there would actually be a bit of spiritual pain that would cause us to ask the question of how can I get involved? How can I help? How can I be a part of the solution? It should make us a little bit uncomfortable to watch brothers and sisters go through things that are hard. It should. That means that we are unified together. I'm talking with Pastor Michael and his wife, Tiffany. Love those two. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about uh, kind of you know, family work-life balance, right? And there's really no such thing as balance. There's really just managing the tensions. It's different seasons, right? I love that. But one of the things that he said to us that we've adopted in our own families, he says, look, uh, he and Tiffany, uh, they're, they're team Hearn, right? This is, how they, this is how they see that they're team Hearn. So again, so when one of them is doing well, they're all doing well. When someone is not doing well, when someone's suffering, they're all not doing well, they're all suffering. And so we've adopted that to say, no, we're team Stoles. That when one of us is doing well, we're all doing well. When one of us is not doing well, we are not doing well. If you call some of you church your home, both in this building and on our online campuses, if you, no matter where you find yourself, whether it's in a different state, whether you're in a different country, I know we have people watching all over the U.S. right now and beyond. 
If you call some of you home, if you're a part of this community, welcome to the team. Welcome to the team. My prayer for us as some of you church, would that be when one of us is hurting, we all feel it. That when one of our brothers and sisters is going through something, we all feel it. And hey, when someone, does, when, when someone is absolutely killing it for the kingdom of God, they are reaching out and they're doing things for the mighty hand of God, we are all cheering behind them and wanting to get involved. This is what we do. How many of you have ever heard of Belgian draft horses? You guys always see these, see these ones before? Magnificent creatures. These things are absolute beasts. These things can pull more than my truck. <laughs> like by themselves, if you were to take one of these, strap it up to something, one of these things can pull 2,000 pounds. I don't know about you, but I gotta do some more work in the gym. I can't pull that. Right, like that's, that's insane. One horse is just like, yeah, that's right. Crushed it. 2,000 pounds. Now see what happens when, when you yoke two of them together, when you unify two together, when you give two the same purpose, we're kind of like, okay, let's do some math here. So yeah, it should be, I don't know, 4,000 pounds. That's usually how math works. Last time I checked, two plus two is four. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe there's maybe like 5,000, six, I mean, six is pushing it. Cause I mean, when you yoke two of these draft horses together, when you give them a direction, a unified purpose for them to march to. These horses can pull 15,000 pounds together. Now, I'm somewhat good at math, but that don't make no sense. All of a sudden, two plus two is now 100. What is going on? That's what happens when you unify people together in a single purpose and you drive them together and you make it. And so you're saying, look, we are in this together. This is what we're capable of, church. Friends, this is what we're capable of. On your own, we can, we can do quite a bit, sure. We can do quite a bit. But we begin to bind together. We begin to actually yoke ourselves together. <laughs> World, look out. The kingdom of God is coming in hot and it will be built. Because see, again, God is a great delegator. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use us as his collective church to bring his kingdom here on earth. And so Paul calls out some roles for the church and he says, these are really to set in place to secure unity within the body. You have the apostles, you have the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. These are people who are sent, the apostles are sent to speak and act with spiritual authority. Prophets are des designated to speak on God's behalf. Evangelists are sent to speak the truth and love of the gospel and to call others to live by Jesus' standards. Pastors, they're the shepherds, those that take care of the flock. Teachers are responsible to faithfully pass on the teachings of Jesus and of scripture through explaining and applying it. All of these roles are simply to do one thing, bind us together as a unified body. Now see, our vision here at Some of You Church, as I said, welcome to the team. If you're a part of Some of You as a whole, whether in person or online, if you are a part of Some of You, welcome to the team. Our vision as a church, what we wanna see done is actually a movement of disciple-making churches, advancing God's kingdom throughout the world. This movement goes beyond us. Where right? it's not about just us as Some of You, this goes beyond us. And this is our vision. But how are we gonna carry that out? What's the mission? How does, this, how does this actively look? Well, we land in verse 12 and Paul says it for us. This is our mission, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We would even say to lead and impact every sphere of life with gospel-centered living until we attain the unity, everybody say unity, unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Friends, this is why we have to be unified together. This is why we have to be unified as one body across the board 
Because if we wanna see a movement of the kingdom of God, this is gonna take a lot more than us as individuals. Again, real moment. I'm wondering how many of us actually show up to church as an individual. That we're coming to church as individuals, individual families, individual people, individual couples. We're, we're, we're coming as independents and saying, the church is here to serve me. Man, I hope the sermon's good or I'm gonna be disappointed. Man, I hope that music just blows me away today. Otherwise, I'm gonna be disappointed. They better have coffee and it better be hot or I'm really gonna be disappointed. Where do they think we live? Arizona, this is the Northwest. Give me good coffee. Right? Or, or do we actually see ourselves coming into this moment together and saying, man, who can I pray for today? And who's hurting today? Man, what, what stories are gonna be told today? Man, I'm so excited to see them. I'm so excited to experience this with them because then we're all in this moment together. Oh, I'm so excited to be a part of what God is doing through Summit View in Clark County. We have to be so, so, so careful not to come as the kingdom of God is here to serve me or you. The kingdom of God is God's alone. Does this mean we're not gonna have differing opinions? Of course not. Does this mean we're gonna sit on different aisles politically? Yeah, sure it is. But friends, we all come under the royal purple color. The color purple is what unifies us together because we serve only King Jesus. Amen. That is who we serve. That is who we are loyal to. King Jesus. And until his kingdom comes in full rank, and until it is a moment where we actually see the kingdom of God coming in all of its glory, there's gonna be bumps in the road. There's gonna be some, some tension points. But there is a, a race to run and a good fight to fight. Paul continues this and, you know, what does this look like? What, how can this really play itself out? Well, Paul continues in verse 13 and he says it way better than I ever could. So let me read this for you. And we're gonna build up to mature manhood or womanhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, this is the pivot point, rather, this is what marks the church, speaking the truth in love. So we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint in which it's equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so it builds itself up in love. This, my friends, is what a unified church looks like. We had a gentleman on staff here for a while who was an elder for a very, very, very long time staff member for a very, very, very long time. Love him dearly, miss seeing him every single day. And he would tell us as a staff in certain points and certain moments, um, and it was always loving, but it was usually to us youth guys when we wanted to do something crazy. This is my Charlie Friesen stern face warning. How many of y'all heard that before? I don't know, maybe sit in that room. Have, Charlie Friesen would give a stern face warning and whenever he gave a stern face warning, hey, everybody listened up. This is my Charlie Friesen Stern face warning. Friends, sometimes we only get one chance. Sometimes we only get one opportunity to, to either sow unity or to sow division. There may be one conversation with one person where we say, you know what, no, and we begin to actually divide instead of taking it as an opportunity, again, giving intellectual equity to how can we meet, not even in the middle, how can we even disagree but put Jesus in the middle? How can we disagree in a loving way? How can we say, hey, you know what, I disagree, but I love you. Hey, I would love to further this conversation in maybe a, a more dynamic way. Let's grab coffee. 
Instead of these moments where it's like, hey, look, you disagree with me? Well, you're wrong and this is why. Let me tell you why I'm right. And if you don't agree and by the time we're done with this, get out. I don't wanna deal with you. I don't wanna see you. And friends, we buy into cancel culture. How dare we ever find ourselves adhering to cancel culture? That's not how the, that is not how the kingdom of God works. We don't cancel anybody. We reach oneness of purpose together. Because see, the, the world knows division. The world knows hate. That's what it knows. That's the language it speaks. It knows division, it knows hate. It knows yelling and screaming and blowing up social media feeds, tagging people in different things just to make a point known, passive aggressive. I mean, they know it all. What they don't know, what they don't know is authentic, vulnerable, caring community. The world doesn't know that. That is where we must stand in opposition to culture. We have to fight. We need people who are marked, who fight for each other and not with each other. We need to be marked by people who actually fight for unity above all else. If we disagree, great. We're coming from all different kinds of backgrounds and biases and whatever, like fine, we're gonna disagree. But what's your motivation in the disagreement? Is your motivation to be right? To put this person down intellectually? To beat them into submission so they finally see your way of thinking? Or we need to stop doing this and start doing this. Start listening to each other having meaningful conversations that are not just are not centered around us and our opinions, but are centered around Jesus. <laughs> are we willing to fight for that? I wanna read for you what Jesus prays for his church in his high priestly prayer in John 17, where Jesus says this, I do not ask for these only, so those around him, but, I, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, the spreading of the gospel, that they may all be one. Everyone say one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them that they may be one. Everyone say one. Everyone say one. One. Even as we, Jesus and the Father, are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one. Everyone. Type it in. One. One so that the world may know. Friends, this isn't even for us. Do we understand that? It's not even for us. We are unified together as the people of God so that the world may know, so that the world can experience his forgiveness and his grace and his kingdom, so the world can see unity, so the world can no longer see division, they can stop seeing colors, they can stop seeing races, they can stop seeing just different, oh, we have to be on the front end of that change. It's not about us. We do this for the sake of other people. This is part of the fun growing up as a pastor's kid. Every single day, my dad would tell me without fail, Kenan, the world does not revolve around you. The world does not revolve around you. Church, friends, family, the church does not revolve around you. The church revolves around King Jesus and King Jesus alone. That is who the church revolves around. May we be a people 
that fight. May we be a people that fight and fight and fight for each other, not with each other. May that be a passion that is down deep in our soul. May we fight for each other for the sake of his kingdom and for the sake of this world.